welcome everyone to the White House uh, for what has become a less frequent briefing here from the podium as we spend a lot of time on the road. Uh, glad you are all here. Very nice to see you. I do not have any announcements to make, so why don't we just go right to questions. Ben. Thanks, Jay. Two topics. I know Jen Psaki yesterday addressed the question about um, Governor Romney's comments on uh, anger and hate and the type of campaign that he was accusing the president of running. But I wanted to ask, uh, follow up on that with you and just uh, get your thoughts more broadly from your conversations with the president about whether he thinks the, the tone of the debate is the right one, whether it's befitting uh, a race for the White House and, and it's helpful to voters. Well, sure. Let me uh, say a couple of things. For those of you who were out with us in the last few days, I think you heard the president uh, speak frequently about incredibly important substantive issues. Substantive issues on which we have policy differences with the Republicans. We talked about drought re uh, relief and the need for Congress to take action on a comprehensive long-term farm bill, uh, something that Republicans have blocked. We talked about the vitally important need to extend the wind energy tax credit that has bipartisan support that uh, the industry has made clear, uh, if not extended, could threaten up to 37,000 jobs in the United States. And that is part of an overall vision for an all of the above energy future that the President has put forward at a substantive policy uh, level uh, again and again. And thirdly, he spoke uh, about Medicare and competing visions on uh, a policy and a program that affects tens of millions of American seniors. That's what the President talked about these past few days. I, I took this question in a different way yesterday, and I, I noted that having covered a number of presidential campaigns myself and other campaigns, uh, that there is often a point at which uh, one side begins to distract attention from the policy debates by suggesting, uh, sometimes without foundation, that there's another story that you all ought to pay attention to. Uh, and that is invariably because that side is losing the policy debates. Um, we are focused on, the President is focused on, the issues that matter to the American economy and the American people. Uh, I think Medicare is a perfect example. Uh, what we have seen since uh, late last week, early this week, when uh, the ticket was for the other side was uh, filled out was this initial <coughs> announcement that there was a desire for a substantive policy debate, and once that substantive policy debate focused on uh, the critical issue of Medicare, uh, there's been obviously a desire on the other side to change the subject. Let's talk about Medicare as well. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think that Medicare is a very important issue. The President thinks it's a very important issue. The President's uh, Affordable Care Act, according to the AARP, uh, an independent voice that seniors value and take seriously, strengthens and protects Medicare. According to the AARP, the Republican plan, the Ryan plan, the Romney plan, undermines Medicare. Uh, you know, we uh, think that's incredibly important. You, the President believes strongly that we cannot, we must not, for the sake of our seniors, turn Medicare into a voucher program. Because the Congressional Budget Office has said that if you do that, Seniors, on average, will see costs rise by $6,400 per year. Not the right policy. Uh, those are the kinds of issues that the President is out there talking about. Uh, and that's what this campaign ultimately is about and will, will be about. And, you know, there are always going to be distractions and both, uh, uh, you know, inadvertent and deliberate. Uh, but in the end, the American people are focused on the economic issues principally that affect their daily lives, and that's what this President's talking about. The, um, thanks. The other topic I want to ask you about that's not getting as much attention in campaign season is the violence in Afghanistan. Um, 
uh, Black Hawk were shot down today, seven American troops, four Afghans killed. We've seen more cases recently of Afghan troops firing on uh, American servicemen. Um, more than 220 Americans have been killed this year in Afghanistan. Does any of this give the President concern about the stability uh, of the Afghan government of, of, the, of the country there? Um, and does it affect his thoughts about the American presence, even though the war is winding down, troops will still be there for another two years? Does it affect his thinking about the, our posture there? Well, let me start with the helicopter. Uh, ISAF did announce that an ISAF helicopter crashed today in southern Afghanistan, killing seven American service members, three Afghan security forces, and one Afghan civilian interpreter. Uh, based on my information, at, at, as of this time, the cause of that crash is still under investigation. But of course, our thoughts and prayers are with uh, those American and Afghan families who lost loved ones in that incident. More broadly, on the matter that uh, of what's called green on blue incidents. There's no question that these incidents are deeply concerning and our hearts go out to the families and friends of those who have lost loved ones in those incidents. You've heard General Dempsey and Secretary Panetta speak in some detail this week about the steps ISAF is taking in Afghanistan to ensure our military service members are as safe as possible and ISAF is continuously assessing and refining procedures and force protection so that we can both meet mission requirements and ensure the safety of our forces. As I have also said Ben, it's important to remember that, uh, well, first of all, that our relationship with our Afghan partners is strong and that every day our forces fight alongside Afghan forces. Uh, there are now about 350,000 Afghan forces uh, and uh, we partner with those Afghan forces on 90 percent of uh, operations. And while the, uh, whenever there is a so-called green on blue incident, it is concerning and the fact that there have been th the number of incidents that you mentioned is, is deeply concerning. It is also important to put it in perspective. And then more broadly, the President's policy in Afghanistan was, after his review, predicated on the principle that our goal, our principal goal for being there is to go after Al-Qaeda, to eliminate Al-Qaeda. Uh, and uh, those who threaten the United States from the AFPAC region. Uh, in the service of that overarching goal, uh, we have uh, helped build up Afghan security forces, helped stabilize uh, portions of the country, uh, and we are in the process of drawing down our forces as we turn over more and more responsibility to Afghan security forces. Uh, let me get to some others uh, first, Goyle. Yeah, thanks. Reuters? Yes, thanks. Um, I want to ask you about the situation in Lebanon where there's been violence to more insecurity that's seen as a spillover from Syria. Um, is the President concerned about sort of a more regional uh, upheaval at the moment and has it affected his vision or plan of how to proceed in um, confronting Assad? Well, as we have said for some time, that the the longer that President Assad stays in power and the longer he continues his assault on his own people, the more likely it becomes that uh, we will witness a broader sectarian conflict uh, that can, can spill over Syria's borders. Uh, we have repeatedly said that we're concerned about this conflict spilling over into other countries in the region. and. and uh, destabilizing other countries in the region. And, and, and that's why the way to prevent it from happening is to bring about uh, the political transition that the Syrian people so deserve and desire. Uh, as for, I think, in terms of the President's view and his policy, I think this development reinforces what he's been saying, that we cannot, that those uh, people and organizations and states that continue to support Assad need to recognize that they are on the wrong side of history. Uh, it is unquestionable that the momentum in Syria is with opposition forces and that, uh, and with the Syrian people and that Assad's uh, will not be a part of the future in Syria. We've seen a series of high-level defections. Another indicator of the fact that Syria's hold, I mean that Assad's hold on Syria uh, is loosening. 
and we are taking action with our international partners uh, to further isolate Assad, to starve his regime of the resources it needs to continue to per perpetuate this violence against the Syrian people. And, uh, uh, at, and at the same time, we are providing uh, substantial humanitarian aid to the Syrian people as well as non-lethal assistance to the opposition. Uh, Nancy and then Jay. Jay, going back to the, um, the anger and hate accusation for a moment, uh, when we asked the Romney campaign uh, why uh, he would make that charge, they cited not so much the things that the president has said on the stump, but things that have happened uh, by the campaign and, and from the White House, things like um, you and the campaign refusing to condemn this outside ad about the steelworker's wife and the connection to Mitt Romney. The fact that um, someone on the campaign suggested that Mitt Romney might be a felon for the way that he ran Bain Capital, and also the vice president's chains comment. Are you ready to condemn any of those things? First of all, let's go back to the obvious attempt to distract attention by focusing so much of your attention on an ad that never ran, as I understood it. I understand well, it, it. It did end up writing it. Again, inadvertently, uh, is according to a press report uh, and a station error. Uh, that is, stands in stark, stark contrast to an advertising campaign behind which there is millions of dollars endorsed by and paid for by the Romney campaign uh, that is built entirely on a fiction about the president's policy, and that's uh, his policy on the work requir requirement necessary in welfare reform. Uh, you know it. Everybody in this room knows it. Every in outside uh, expert on this issue has uh, declared that the advertising campaign on welfare reform is false just false, factually false. Uh, and yet there's all this attention on an outside ad that, as again, has barely run. Uh, I think that uh, you know that there are plenty of third-party ads uh, out there that, uh, on, uh, that are in support of Governor Romney that uh, allege uh, certain things that are ridiculous, including suggesting that the President is not an American citizen. What this president is doing is focusing on the issues that matter to the American people, okay? What do you say to Republicans who say that the vice president's comments about putting people back in chains is an example of why he should be replaced on the ticket? Well, I'd say a couple of things. One is uh, they know that what they're saying about this is ridiculous. The vice president was clearly making, as he uh, repeated later uh, a statement about the Republican insistence that if they uh, are able to, by taking control of the White House, um, they will immediately repeal Wall Street reform. Uh, Wall Street reform that was put in place and fought for by this President uh, because we cannot afford uh, to have happen what happened in the financial sector to this country uh, just a few short years ago. We need to make it impossible for the taxpayers to be holding the bag uh, when uh, big institutions fail, if they fail. Uh, we need to make sure that we have the consumer pr protections in place that are part of Wall Street reform uh, that were fought tooth and nail by Wall Street and by Republicans on the Hill. Uh, and, and, and the point was obvious to, I know, everyone in this room, to everyone in that room, and to every Republican who's making this charge, that that's what the Vice President was talking about. So I understand, going back to my other point, that there's an attempt to distract attention from the actual substance of the discussion, which is, should we or should we not have Wall Street reform? They don't want to talk about that because they know that most Americans answer that question absolutely, definitely, yes. But they're opposed to it. Should we or should we not turn Medicare into a voucher system that costs seniors an extra $6,400 per person per year? Overwhelmingly, the American people say no, but Republicans don't want to debate that because they know that's the answer. Uh, so, look, we're, we're going to keep talking about the issues, and there's going to be along the road here, as there always is, uh, an attempt to distract attention from the issues when one side is losing the debate over the issues, and that's what we're seeing right now. Regret the choice of words because some took it as a reference to slavery, and, and he had a chance to nobody go back and he said, I, I always say exactly what I mean. Except 
uh, I, except for those who are trying to make something out of nothing here and distract attention from the policy debates. I mean, this is, you, you know that's not what this is about. You know he was talking, if you look at what he said, about Wall Street reform, about, uh, you know, the desire of some to put banks and Wall Street back in charge of your financial transactions in life. That's not what this president believes is the right policy. Uh, so we can, uh, uh, you know, we understand that there's going to be efforts to distract attention from the policy debates because the uh, other side is losing these policy debates pretty overwhelmingly. Uh, but we're going to keep talking about the policy issues. Can I follow on that question? Uh, Jake, I said I'd call on Jake next week, but I'll get to you. The president the other day uh, made three allusions to Mitt Romney putting his dog <laughs> on his roof. Is that part of this important policy debate? He made one allusion in three different speeches that was a joke. Just like I think the Romney campaign and others have joked about uh, the fact that in the president's memoir he talked about as a boy uh, eating dog meat in Indonesia because that uh, is something that's done there. You know, I, I think a little levity uh, is a lot different from the kind of you know, ridiculous charges that are being made here. The whole, but that, it's an interesting case in point. The, the president on that day spent a great deal of time talking about the importance of the wind energy tax credit, uh, the importance to the renewable energy sector in this country, uh, which uh, has doubled its output, its production under this president because of the historic uh, investments that uh, this administration has made in that sector, and uh, about the fact that extension of that tax credit is supported by both Democrats and Republicans Republicans in the states that are principally affected, including governors and senators, uh, but is opposed by Congress, Washington Republicans. Um, uh, that's an issue that affects uh, the jobs and livelihood of up to 7,000 people in Iowa. It affects the jobs and livelihood of up to 37 people around 37,000 people around the country uh, in an industry that that, that employs uh, roughly 75,000 people. Uh, in this country, and, and, and it's an industry that has been growing and will continue to grow if we make the kinds of wise investments that will ensure that as we move forward in this century, uh, we rely less and less on foreign imports of energy and more and more on American en energy. And that's, that is a substantive policy issue. And like one joke as an aside should not become the focus of uh, the campaign or the coverage of the campaign. I, I understand that Republicans don't want to talk about the wind energy yeah, tax credit. You guys are so naive as to, as to think that the president talking about Mitt Romney putting his dog on his roof isn't going to elevate that and become what Chuck Todd might refer to as cable catnip, and that will step on uh, that will step on the president's own message on wind energy. I don't think you, I mean, especially considering it was obviously in his prepared remarks. Well, let me make clear that uh, the president's message that day was on wind energy. It was not on a, a joke, and, and maybe, uh, maybe I am naive to think that a, a one-line joke uh, about, you know, a dog would not then become the principal focus of the coverage of the president for the day. I know it wasn't in Iowa the principal focus right. of the coverage. Uh, the focus was on the importance of the wind energy tax credit. But, uh, you know, I, I take your point, and I'll be less naive in the future. All right, I appreciate that. Can we talk about Medicare for a second? Please. Does the president believe that Medicare is on a sustainable path right now? Uh, the president believes that, uh, and knows, and others have judged it so, that the Affordable Care Act uh, that he fought hard for and that Congress passed and he signed into law extends right. the life of, no, wait, I'll get to, I'll, I'll answer your question more fully, extends the life of Medicare uh, by eight years, the solvency of Medicare by eight years. Uh, he knows that, as outside experts have made clear, if the Affordable Care Act is repealed, as Republican leaders, the Republican nominee, uh, have uh, ardently expressed their desire to do, Medicare's insolvency will come eight years sooner. That's an irrefutable fact. Uh, he knows that, as he said in, in the discussions and debates and the proposals about the steps we need to take to get our fiscal house in order uh, through a balanced approach to uh, reducing our deficit, uh, that we need to uh, 
make additional reforms that protect beneficiaries but ensure, ensure that uh, Medicare remains in place as Medicare, right. not a voucher system, for future generations. Okay. So, so the fact is he has, through his actions, that you know, despite great resistance from Republicans, extended the life of Medicare. But he knows that much more needs to be done well, to no, keep it sustainable. There's no question that, so, that we have serious fiscal challenges that we need to address, and we need to address them in a balanced way. Right. We don't need to do it in a way, I mean, one of the marvels of the marvelous, exciting Ryan budget is that uh, despite claims to deficit hawkishness, is that that budget makes no claims to balancing deficits, or, or eliminating deficits, uh, until something like 30 years from now. Uh, because it's so preoccupied with giving and dominated by giving tax cuts to wealthy Americans. So about a year ago when the uh, grand bargain talks were going on, um, I believe right before they, they fell apart, the president came into this room and I asked him what was one thing he was willing to concede on Medicare and, and win all this negotiation. And he said that he, would be, he wouldn't talk about the retirement age, he wouldn't touch it, but he did talk about how maybe further means testing uh, would be something that he'd be willing to consider. But since then, we haven't really seen any serious proposal to help the sustainability of Medicare and say what you will about the Ryan plan. It does look forward. It does, it is a plan, or, or the Romney plan. It, there is a an outline there for trying to change the system to preserve it. Again, I understand you disagree with that. Mm -hmm. Where is the president's plan? Well, I think the president, at what he said to you uh, in this briefing room, uh, remains true today. And it's reflected in the budget proposal he put forward, both for the super committee and again this year, uh, has additional reforms and savings from uh, out of federal health care spending. But what it does not do is attempt to get our fiscal house in order by placing the entire burden on seniors and families with disabled children uh, or other low-income Americans who depend on these health care programs, uh, literally for in some, case, in some cases for their survival. That's just not, we, and you know what, the thing is, we don't have to do that. The President's plan, other balanced plans that have been put forward demonstrate that you do not have to do that. Uh, you do not have to voucherize Medicare, basically eliminate Medicare and turn it into a voucher system. Uh, if you're willing to, on the other side, make some compromises, uh, on the principle that everyone ought to pay their fair share, that we need revenue to be part of the package when we address our fiscal challenge. It, 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 I, I, it never, it's a complete inside baseball, inside the beltway conversation, but I am constantly amazed at the willingness of uh, Republicans who in one breath will say absolutely no revenue, uh, absolutely no defense cuts. In fact, I want defense increases, but I love the Simpson-Bowles plan. And you know, because you know what's in the Simpson-Bowles plan, that they don't know what they're talking about. Maybe they haven't read it, Maybe they've deliberately, you know, put their fingers in their ears when there are reports on it. But the Simpson-Bowles plan has more tax revenue than what the president called for, has far deeper de defense cuts than what the president has called for. Uh, but it has similar discretionary cuts that the president has already signed into law and pledged. Uh, so, you know, there has to be, a, and, I'll, and I'll end here, I know I'm testing your patience, but there has to be some... You know, you can't blithely say, as Governor Romney has and Lindsey Graham and others, you know, my plan, says Romney, is very similar to Simpson-Bowles. Well, I think Erskine-Bowles made clear that that's laughable. Uh, it's simply not, because if you stand up on stage and say, I won't ask the wealthiest, I won't ask for one dollar of revenue for every ten dollars in spending cuts, uh, you don't know what you're talking about when you say you your plan is very similar to Simpson. Yeah. The President's Medicare plan is contained within his budget. Uh, look, the President has put forward in his budget proposal additional savings in our health care uh, programs, not through, uh, ask, you know, not by cuts in benefits, but by, uh, you know, savings uh, from providers and insurance companies, which is what the kinds of savings he achieved in the Affordable Care Act. It's not really in but, itself but I'm not saying that, that, I'm not saying that ends, you know, the, the discussion about the kinds of further challenges we face in our fiscal future, but it is it does achieve the $4 trillion in deficit reduction that we need, and it does uh, achieve it in a balanced way that includes savings. No, and, but, uh, but it achieves it in a balanced way that includes savings in health care reform, I mean savings in health care, which, by the way, demonstrates the approach he took during deficit reduction talks and the debt ceiling talks, 
uh, which was one of a willingness to compromise and make tough choices, uh, sometimes against the wishes of some of his fellow Democrats, because he knew that uh, in order to achieve this, you need to do it in a bipartisan way and you needed to reach a compromise. But instead, there was an absolute refusal to accept the notion that we needed revenue. Uh, and there was a, you know, a, a role played in the failure of those discussions, the failure of Simpson Bowles, and the failure of the grand bargain talks, uh, you know, by the guy who's now uh, running for vice president. Thank you. Jack, can I follow up? Uh, I think I do. I'll go Kristen. Yeah, uh, we'll go. We'll go. <laughs> Kristen, Brianna, and Thanks, then Jack. I'll move back. Uh, you and Jen were asked about this yesterday, but you didn't have an answer at the time, so I just want to circle back. Has the President actually spoken to Vice President Biden about the chain's comments, or does he plan to do so? Today? I don't know if the President has had, I mean, he speaks with the Vice President all the time. I don't know if they, they say that. I know you can see, I think the President was asked about this, and it was put out in one of his interviews yesterday, uh, that, you know, he absolutely understands and knows what the, pre the Vice President was talking about, as does everybody in this room. I'm sure there are some exceptions who pretend otherwise, but the, 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 uh, you know, the, he was talking about Wall Street reform, and you know what, the President is 100 percent with the Vice President in his commitment to ensuring that Wall Street reform stays in place. And I understand that he defended the Vice President, but was he frustrated at all that this took attention away from what he was trying to do in Iowa? Not that I saw. I mean, I, look, I think that w he understands what I was talking about earlier, that there are going to be, uh, you know, confected you know, distractions from uh, the important issues of the day. That's part of every campaign, and it's often the result of one side trying to change the subject um, when they're losing the debate on the substantive policy issues that matter most to the American people. And there is no question that uh, when it comes to protecting seniors on Medicare, when it comes to protecting uh, businesses small and large that are part of our renewable energy sector, especially wind energy, uh, that this president has been making uh, very strong policy arguments uh, and that uh, at a substantive level as well as at a level of support from the American people, he's winning those arguments. Does he have any concern that the vice president will make these types of verbal missteps moving forward? Uh, I, I understand this, this unbelievable obsession about trivia, uh, as I've been trying to discuss. The fact of the matter is that the Vice President was talking about a policy issue, um, which there is an attempt to turn into, uh, you know, an insubstantial uh, campaign issue that's divorced from policy because Republicans don't want to talk about the fact that they are ardently in favor of repealing Wall Street reform because they know that the American people are uh, determined to see that Wall Street reform stay in place. Also, Jay, does the President have a reaction to the uh, case in Pennsylvania, the voter ID laws that were upheld? Does he see that in any way as a blow to his reelection effort or his effort in Pennsylvania at least? Uh, well, I'd say a couple of things about that. I know the campaign has addressed uh, this. Um, I, and and I, I would point you to the campaign's statements. The uh, the broader principle here is one that I think I've talked about, which is that this president is committed to, and I know the Department of Justice is committed to ensuring that uh, Americans enjoy and get to uh, take advantage of that most basic and fundamental right, which is the right to vote. Um, but in terms of the specific cases, I would refer you to the Department of Justice or to the campaign. Jim. Brianna, and then I'll move back. Yeah. Um, Arizona Governor Jan Brewer has issued an executive order ordering state agencies to deny driver's licenses and other public benefits to young illegal immigrants who get work authorization under this new Obama administration policy. Do you have a reaction to that? I don't. It looks like you just pulled it up online, so I, I haven't seen that. I'm just reading it off my Word document. But, um, <laughs> Well, so then, let's go to the vice president's comments. You, you know, you guys are, you're, you're almost, you're, 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 well, go ahead. <laughs> um, <laughs> former Virginia Governor Douglas Wilder, a Democrat, he basically called them inappropriate, the comments. He said you can't defend it. 
Do you think that the first African American governor since Reconstruction is, as you put it, trying to make something out of nothing and distract from policy they, debates, or does he have a point? He doesn't have a point. The vice president was talking about Wall Street reform. Uh, you know, as everyone who speaks publicly for a living, or as part of what they do uh, in this arena, and I include myself, uh, you know, there, it, every day that you go out there and give a speech or answer questions, you know, there's always the possibility that something you say uh, and the way you say it can be um, misunderstood or taken out of context and made a big deal of. Uh, when everyone knows, and I know you know, and everyone who watched the tape, who knows the vice president, knows that he was talking about Wall Street reform. It speaks to the sensitivity of using words like that. Look, there's no question that there are issues, you know, there's a, there, there are uh, sensitivities around words, but again, as I just said, every, you know, Vice President, President, Governor Romney, Congressman Ryan, others in the arena go out there and speak all the time. They answer questions all the time. And, uh, you know, I think that it's important uh, to acknowledge in the remarkable amount of airtime for something that is so weightless that is being devoted to this subject uh, that you also make clear that you know and you know you know that, that the vice president was talking about Wall Street reform you don't and why Wilder would be offended by the comments I, I, I understand that one person has expressed his opinion that he's offended by it, this is it person but this is the first yeah. African-American governor since reconstruction yeah. the vice president's intention was clear what he was talking Obviously about not. is clear well, yeah, it's not clear. is it not clear to you? Was he not talking about Wall Street? I thought okay. personally, I think when you use the word chains in a crowd with Look. many African Americans, oh. you better be careful of I what you're the, talking I about. I think the vice president at a later event uh, made clear that you know his word choice was off; that he had been using similar phrases, uh, you know, similar, you know, saying similar things with slightly different phrasing. But the the purpose of that section of his comments was to talk about the absolute need to ensure that Wall Street reform is not repealed. Um, and you know that that's not, like, that this is not what the campaign's about. The campaign is about do we repeal Wall Street reform or do we continue to implement it? Do we turn Medicare into a voucher system or do we ensure that we take steps to strengthen it and preserve it for America's seniors? Do we pass $5 trillion in tax cuts that disproportionately benefit the wealthy. Think about the size of that, $5 trillion. That's $500 billion a year. I mean, that's real money. And uh, do we do that, and, you know, doing incredible damage to our deficits, devastating investments in education, innovation, research and development, infrastructure spending, roads, bridges, highways, schools? Or do we take a balanced approach to our fiscal challenges that, in addition to the substantial spending cuts the President has signed into law, the substantial savings he has put forward in his budget proposal, we ask millionaires and billionaires to pay a little bit more, to go back to, when it comes to the Bush tax cuts, the top marginal rate that was in place when Bill Clinton was President. and. You know, I never cease to marvel at the rhetoric about, you know, the, the, the doom and gloom that Republicans promise if, 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 this, if this rate was reinstated, uh, because it's eerily similar to the doom and gloom that they promised would occur in this country uh, the first time around when, when the Clinton budget passed in the spring of 1993. And what we saw instead was the opposite of what was predicted and promised by Republican leaders, including the current Speaker of the House. We saw record economic growth, record expansion, and record job creation. Okay, April. Oh, Ed. No, I said Ed. Then April. Sorry. Well, you will. Go ahead. Um, on the on the vice president, one short question. Not going to get. I, I hear exactly what you're saying. I'm not going to repeat the same stuff. But since the president has given the vote of confidence, and you've defended the vice president repeatedly, is to settle it once and for all. All this speculation. This is the ticket. Obama Biden. <laughs> I think. That's a yes or no. It's not yes. A yes. And that was settled a long, long time ago. And while I appreciate, I have great admiration for and respect for and a long relationship with Senator John McCain, uh, but one place I would not go for advice on vice presidential 
running mates is to Senator McCain. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. No, 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 on that, uh, one question on that, and I wasn't going to belabor it, and you answered it, thank you. On Medicare, a substantive issue, in the, in the answers to Jake, you said at the end there, you acknowledged that the president had not put all the details on the table. You acknowledged that, that more savings. No, I didn't say that. You said more savings said needs to be achieved. There's no question that uh, as we go forward as a country, we're going to have to continue to deal with, and, and that includes uh, you know, this president and future presidents, right. with our fiscal challenges. But the president has put forward a budget proposal that uh, creates $4 trillion in deficit reduction, more than $4 trillion, does it through a balanced approach of cuts in discretionary spending, uh, non-defense and defense, cuts in uh, savings out of uh, health care and uh, reform program, I mean, health care and Jake, programs. when he and said his budget plan then is where the Medicare details are, and you said, well, there's, that's a start, but there needs to be more. So well, it's a, pro a, pro a process where uh, the Affordable Care Act, in addition to extending insurance to 30 million people who didn't have it, in addition to providing seniors with millions and millions of dollars in savings on their prescription drugs by closing the donut hole, in addition to allowing young Americans uh, 26 and under to remain on their uh, parents' health insurance, in addition to uh, making sure that those with pre-existing conditions can get insurance and those with pre-existing, those with, uh, uh, you know, the camp and, and that Americans who develop uh, an illness can't be thrown off their insurance policies. In addition to all that, it, it, it extends the life of Medicare by an additional eight years. And this is a, obviously a project that we have to continue to address. There are additional savings put forward in the President's budget. And, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm certainly accepting the uh, supposition that, uh, you know, we will as a country continue to need to address our fiscal challenges and the growth of spending in our, in our federal health care programs. What we cannot do is eliminate Medicare. What we cannot do is turn Medicare into a voucher system and basically tell seniors, you know what, the way we're going to deal with this problem is not find savings within the system, not, uh, you know, reduce the cost of health care, but just basically shift it to you. So, to, so, question so, is, so that your, you know, elderly relatives are going to have to, you know, would have to pay, or, or, or you when you get old, would have to pay $6,400 extra per year for your health care. You know, there are a lot of seniors out there who will not be able to afford that. Well, my question is, Ryan has put his details out there. You're hitting them. When does the president put his details out, those extra details, before the election or after the election? No, Ryan, look, the president. We still have to continue to confront our, our fiscal challenges, what's on the table now. I don't think eight, an extra eight years to Medicare only kicks it down eight more years. Everyone so, acknowledges you've got to do more. But I think you need to uh, focus a little more attention on, on what's in the Ryan budget proposal. Again, but does not even a back is the counter to that, I guess. The president's is it budget. The, it's the budget. That's the, all his All Ryan's put forward a proposal that I think uh, claims to achieve something like five, tr five trillion in, in deficit reduction, I believe it is. Uh, and the president puts forward one, a proposal that achieves uh, over four trillion. Uh, the Romney Ryan plan, if you will, uh, has to uh, cut drastically discretionary spending, investments in education, innovation, infrastructure, Department of Transportation, everything that people think of as uh, federal investments uh, dramatically. And it also has to uh, turn Medicare into a voucher program uh, in order largely to pay for not reducing our deficit, not uh, building the economic foundation of this country, but to give tax cuts. Now, I understand that they believe in their hearts that that's good for the economy, that, as the President says, you know, that, that uh, the fairy dust will be sprinkled across the country and everyone will benefit. He said snake but, well, yesterday. Or snake oil. Uh, I think I'd rather be sprinkled with fairy dust than snake oil. But, Last question. As part of this serious discussion of policy uh, issues, the president sat down with entertainment tonight, yesterday, and said that he, uh, that nobody could say that he's dividing the country. Uh, we've always tried to bring the country together. So you were asked before about the cancer ad again. Why then won't the president say in that interview or anywhere that since he wants to focus on these serious issues, why doesn't he tell any, any of his advisors out there this does not fit with that? This does not well, fit all, with this. We don't. He doesn't dictate to or, or coordinate with disagree. That, that's uh, not party what groups. And, and he, uh, 
you have, and I know you're out there with us often. You you hear his tone when he speaks. You hear the issues that he talks about. Um, and there's no question that these you know we have tough debates about the issues. And uh, as you know, there has been a relentless uh, critical. Uh, uh, evaluation by one by the Republican side of the president's record of his uh, proposals, uh, paid for in hundreds of millions of dollars of advertising over the, the past several years, and and specifically by by the Romney campaign, and on the issues the president is obviously going to engage and has engaged, and because he thinks the stakes are so very high for the American people, um, the. You know, he will uh, continue to focus on the issues, continue to talk about his very optimistic vision for the American economy and the American people. Uh, and uh, because he knows that that's what this is all about for him and for the country. And, and that, tho that those, those issues, to go back to my earlier point, uh, are, are what you know, the American people want to decide this election. And those are the issues that will decide this election. So, uh, you know. A, a, a third party ad that essentially had no money behind it, never appeared except accidentally on one station once, um, versus you know, a focus on uh, the issues that's backed up by the President's campaign and all the efforts that, that it's engaged in. Uh, and and you know, on the one hand, and then to uh, compare apples to apples as opposed to apples to oranges or pears or pomegranates, the um, the Romney campaign has, as a matter of policy, invested tens of millions of dollars in an advertising campaign that's based on a blatantly false assertion about the president's policy. Um, you know, I think you know my feelings on that. April. Subjects and thanks to Mark Nolan's great pool report that Vice President Biden and the President are having lunch right now. What should we anticipate? Yes, Mark said it. He was just with the President. Um, Mark, I know you're an intrepid reporter, but you probably got that from the published schedule, right? Yeah. But either way, but he just right, right. But he just left the president saying that he walked in in the pool report. If you follow Mark's pool report, you, you guys know that since you've been covering this, the president, and the vice president, have as a standing proposition lunch every week, right? Every week when they're in town. Obviously, they're both traveling a lot and more, so it may not be every week, but it is. I worked for him. You know, this is something that happens every week. As do the president's weekly meetings with Secretary Clinton and Secretary Geithner, uh, which the vice president, when he's in town, always participates in. This is routine stuff. So what's, the, what's the stuff that's not routine that's going to be on the plate? Nothing. Okay. It's all. They're not going to talk about the chains at all. Biden chains. You know, I think I think uh, the focus on this is. Uh, Pretty much entirely yours and not ours. We're we're not, you know. This is a, uh, as I said before, uh, a non-issue. It's the the vice president was talking about Wall Street reform, the absolute urgent need to ensure that it remains in place, uh, the opposition to that principle by the uh, Republican Party and the Republican candidates for president and vice president, and uh, as I said before, there's no, you know. There's always an attempt during campaigns to distract attention from the substance of policy issues when you're losing the substance of policy issues and debates. But I understand the dynamic of how it happened. It started with Ryan, then with Biden, and then you had other people to chime in. But have you ever heard of the word called pun, a play on words? Understanding Never. what happened. Okay. <laughs> Understanding what happened and, and, and listening to Jake. Jake is right. And, and, and going back to what Brianna said about Governor Wilder, Governor Wilder said that race was interjected. And he even says, understanding as a, as a grandson of slaves. April, I think you heard or saw that the Vice President said in his next uh, appearance or soon thereafter, it, it explained the, the use of his words, his language, and, and you know how he had meant to phrase it. And, and I think I made the point that we all, all of us who are out there every day, giving speeches, taking questions, talking about the issues, you know, sometimes don't use you know the exact language that we thought we were going to use or wanted to use. But you know what he was talking about. You know that he was talking about a substantive issue, and it certainly was not his intention. Uh, 
at all. Is that what you're trying to say? Well, I, no, he wasn't. Okay, no, wait, no, wait, no, 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 not finished. Hold on, hold on. Just one second, just one second. Wait a minute. Do you think race ever needs to be interjected in this campaign as many African Americans, the day that Ryan was announced, uh, many African Americans, particularly black ministers, bombarded this White House with concerns because of the Ryan budget, how it cut into uh, middle and low income uh, programs, uh, support for those programs. Do you think race will ever have to be injected in this I, campaign? I think the issue with the Republican budget proposals, the Romney-Ryan plans, uh, is that they harm Americans across the board, middle class Americans, low income Americans, seniors. Um, they're just not the right economic prescription. As the, as the President says, the, the vice presidential nominee on the other side is an articulate spokesman for Governor Romney's economic vision. He just happens to dis disagree with that vision. And that's, that's the debate we're having. That's the debate in many ways we've been having for the last couple of years. And uh, the President looks forward to continuing to talk about why uh, we cannot pursue, we cannot afford as a country a $5 trillion tax cut. We cannot afford as a country the decimation of our investments in education and innovation and infrastructure. Uh, we can't attempt to get our fiscal house in order by asking seniors uh, to accept vouchers instead of Medicare and to uh, shoulder the burden of an extra, on average, $6,400 per year in costs for their health care. That's just not the right economic policy vision this president believes for this country. Using a whiteboard, he sketched out the difference between his Medicare or in Congressman Ryan's Medicare plan and the president's. And one of the points he makes is that <laughs> under President Obama's approach, uh, those approaching retirement, 55 and over, would indeed see changes, and under his plan, they would not. Is that? Would you remind us whether the president would change benefits of the plan of Social Security for those who are 55 and over? I'm sorry, you mean Medicare? I see Medicare. Uh, the president's plan protects benefits. The AARP has said, let's be clear, has said that the president's Affordable Care Act strengthens and protects. Medicare benefits and beneficiaries. The Ryan budget, the Romney-Ryan proposal, which, by the way, I haven't, I didn't see this press conference, but just because it's constantly unclear every day, the answer to this question, the Governor Ryan, Romney said, uh, actually, Paul, this is uh, in an interview, I believe, last night in Wisconsin, Romney, actually, Paul Ryan and my plan for Medicare, I think, is the same. It's probably close to identical. So uh, we know what that plan is. I mean, we've been debating it. We've, it's been passed the House. It, it, it voucherizes Medicare. It shifts costs to seniors. Uh, the President's plan does none of that. The President's plan extends the life of Medicare. It uh, has already bequeathed uh, millions of dollars in savings to seniors uh, by closing the donut hole. It has given millions of seniors the opportunity for free preventive services like uh, mammograms and cancer screenings. Uh, you know, this is just a, a different vision. And I, look, it, it, this is exactly what we want to be talking about. These are the substantive issues that will be decided for this country and that will have huge impact on this country and on America's seniors and, and, and others for years to come. Is he correct that those I, I seen, over I mean, I think the under answer the is, Obama plan mm -hmm. would have a change in their Medicare benefits? I don't, I don't know what change you're talking about. The President protects Medicare beneficiaries and med uh, Medicare benefits. He has uh, the savings he achieved through the Affordable Care Act have uh, uh, extended the life of the Medicare program by eight years, and they uh, come not from Medicare beneficiaries, not from benefits, but from providers and insurance companies uh, through savings and waste and fraud. Uh, you know, this, uh, this is a very important debate, and, and the President looks forward to engaging in it. Hey, Jay, one other thing from that press conference. <laughs> Robbie said he's, he's never paid We should have had it up here so I could. <laughs> 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 no, no, he probably won't respond. He's never paid less than 13 uh, I, I, I don't have a reaction. I think uh, my, my statement to that would simply be that um, this president believes that the tradition of, uh, as a pres for presidential candidates to put forward multiple years of their tax returns is a useful and valu valuable one, not always a comfortable one, uh, but uh, one that he has certainly abided by, and uh, 
he thinks is uh, one that the American ex uh, people uh, believe is right and, and uh, expect their candidates to abide by. Yes. Um, does the new immigration order potentially leave all these young people in a state of limbo because it doesn't confer legal status? And then also, following up on Brianna's question earlier about Governor Brewer, since she did, the governor issued this executive order last night, mm -hmm. and it would basically be denying driver's licenses to these same people who are applying. Um, it's obviously very hard to get to work if you don't have a driver's license. So is there concern about how some states are trying to skirt this rule? I, I simply, and I appreciate that it was last night and that Brianna didn't just call it up on her uh, on her screen, I, I, but I, I have not seen it and I simply don't know enough about it to, to give you a comment on it. Uh, the answer to your first question is yes, this is not uh, a long-term solution. The President believes and fought hard uh, for uh, the DREAM Act and believes that Congress ought to pass it. And, uh, the administrative action taken by this administration, led by DHS, is you know is to uh, make sure that we're using prosecutor prosecutorial discretion in a way that uh, focuses our resources on um, uh, you know criminals and uh, not on so-called Dream Act kids who, uh, as the president said. You know, got he arrived in this country when they were very young. You know, grew up in the United States, consider themselves Americans. Uh, you know, who and and who are uh, are or can contribute mightily to this country. I would imagine the president would not be pleased seeing what Governor Brewer. Yeah, I, I just hesitate to offer an assessment uh, since I have not seen that story. And hang on, are you any surprise on the turnout? We're seeing so many people around the country coming out applying for this. Any is the administration surprised by this number? Um, I don't. I don't know how to judge uh, that. I because I'm not sure what what numbers were expected. Thank you. Jay. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, I, I, I made a statement about it yesterday. Uh, the president was informed about it by his homeland security advisor, John Brennan, um, and uh, you know his uh, he was very concerned about uh, the. Victim, the, the the person who was shot, and and made clear to me, and I uh, conveyed this to the pool that he firmly believes that violence of that kind has no place in our society, and this goes to the greater discussion we've had about violence in America and the need to tackle it uh, on multiple fronts. Would you consider a hate crime or an act of I think those kinds of determinations are made by the FBI, and I know the FBI is uh, part of this investigation. Thank, Thank you. Thank you.